we thought it was important to let people know that we have a collection of over 6,300 objects of art and artifacts in our collection. Just look at that. It is, it is the, the way in which the cower shells are looking like they are ripples. And, 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 and it's just, you know, I want you, I want you to be the exotic other, but I want to understand you in my language. And that's part of the problem that we all deal with. In that like, um, they had something to say? It's just, I do. I feel like um, we have to keep pushing forward. There's always been this thing in L.A. where there's the black art world and there's the white art world. I mean, we don't say it in those terms, but we're very aware of everything. You're aware of your race, your class, your sexuality, where you went to school, if you did go to school, if you didn't go to school. Um, and if you're not aware of it, just become an artist and the world will make you aware of it. Are there any plans or any ideas that supports the black LA artists, the black artists in the LA area? I'd like to ask the same question to Mocha, they were here. All of the major institutions that are here as venues or in Los Angeles as venues for, for artists to exhibit. It's just a question I would like to know because I pretty much covered, you know, the, 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 uh, the major institutions in Los Angeles except for Latin. That would be my question. In African American communities, we have a really hard time jumping up to support our own until they get ready to take us away. And then we march in somewhere. You, you spoke a lot about the spirit, I think, Charmaine, of, of Cam. I was just wondering, what was the, the, the one thing that, that um, went into the founding of the museum? Like, what was the reason who around Los Angeles was like, we have got to have our museum now? African American artists couldn't be seen in other places. And, you have um, Samella Lewis having started the Museum of African American Art uh, slightly before that, but the idea was to create, frankly, the black equivalent of a Latin or a Met. That was the original thinking. And remember, you're, you're coming out of the time of the, the black movement and et cetera, so there's also people who wanted to delve into the history even more than just pure art. That meant for all of that effort that was pushed, trying to push the envelope. So many people trying to push the envelope. But there really was intentionally this idea of being able to show that African American artists were as fine, as good, etc. And, and if you start to delve into some of the artists who were out of that time, many of them were very activists. Charles White, who we probably think of as you know, very uh, traditional, was activist. And if you take the activism of, of Ruth Waddy and several others, those people were constantly pushing the envelope. And I think that there's a difference between now and then. And the value of the dialogue that you all are having is that one, you're talking to each other, is if you go back and look, when we did our Places of Validation Art Progression Show, the point was to say there were all these pockets of people who were working together, particularly in the African American community, to show their work. And they had factions. This group didn't like that group, that person liked this kind of art, this kind of normal stuff. But what they did was that they supported each other and they pushed to show each other's work and go to each other's art shows and tell other people about what they were doing and they exchanged and they bartered. And so some of the best collections are actually in the hands of the artists themselves because they were exchanging yeah. work. Yes. And so I think that that the experiences that were out there is what this museum was intended to try to bring to bear. The only problem of being so public with my career is I'm under a microscope a little bit. They just dissect everything. When you explore, sometimes you have some great things, and then you have some not so great things, and it's you always like you're constantly with showing your draws in public. That's what I call it. It's like you know, it's like you're constantly. So you can have a, a bad day, everybody's gonna know you have a bad day, but what are you gonna do? I, I work a lot with education, I work a lot with mentoring, I do a lot in my studio, I do these things. So it's sort of like, I don't, the, the power's not the big thing, it's just what you're gonna do with it. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't really do, I do what I wanna do, um, but people just have more to, it's funny, before I went to MacArthur, some people have an opinion of me and some people didn't. As soon as you win the MacArthur, every single person has an opinion of you. Either good or bad, or he should have won, or and it's just different. And you just have to 
what I what I try not to do is I try to stay just as honest and open and vulnerable and as I've always been. So I really try not to let any of that get in the way of just dialogue and communication. I've heard Kara Walker say that same thing. And Kara, yeah. yeah, yeah. But she received it, but this laser focus yep. was on her, yep. her, and not so much on her work. Yeah. You know, she's always been about my work is on the wall. Look at my work. Yeah. You know, but it was about King's and instantly became about her. Well, but then you say we want, but then here's another, the flip side. We go to these fancy schools and we start having shows and we get rid of, but then you start becoming successful. I, I think that we always think about entering into what we do, but we never plan for what if we become successful. I think that you kind of have to just navigate it. Whatever level you are, if you're a director, museum director, that's a certain type of currency. If you're an artist at a certain level, so I really see it as just, I see everything and all of us as simply navigating. I think the problem is that when we start to, to say, this is better than that, this is not as good yeah, yeah. as that, those yeah. people, that's when we, the ranking, and the, that's where we start to, everything starts to become a problem, but I don't really think, uh, um, but I had, didn't plan for it, but now I'm more consciously thinking about, okay, Mark, so what are you going to do with this? And that's when I became interested in education, and that's when I became, so I realized, okay, now what am I going to do with this? Like, I'm not just out of Cal Arts. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the MacArthur. Dr. Jordan Harris is an art collector, but she also has a lot of experience with the Brockman Gallery. As a people, we're not all educated about the value of our art. In the context of, of some of the things that we're talking about, we just have to remember that it is a global conversation. I was just at uh, Art Dubai. So you have all of these artists coming out of Lebanon, Egypt, Iran, all worried about exactly the same thing that you were talking about. Am I going to be perceived as too Middle Eastern? Hmm. Or if I'm not too Middle Eastern, am I going to sell because I'm not giving the people what they want? And that's why we talk in this you know, sort of international uh, way. But I, I mean, for me, I must say it's nice to be able to be here to speak from this point of view as well. And, and if you don't support that worldview, you don't get included in the mix. Greg, you want to tell us? He just wrote a wonderful review on the POV show here at CAM, and he got it published in Artillery, which is a very well-read art periodical. The PR piece is critical. Most artists of color, most of the culturally specific institutions, they would have the exact same conversation that says, I, I can't get the coverage. We're more likely to get coverage for a history show than we are for an art show. But I do know, frankly, that if we just write the article, I probably can get it in because we wrote it. We have a modest budget that we have to continually fundraise for. So for example, we have a big Alice and Sar exhibition that's coming up in fall, and we have not been able to raise any money to that exhibition yet. I know that being black is going to walk in the room first, being gay is going to walk in, being raised where I was raised, all these things walk in. At the very end, like Mark comes walking in. Mm -hmm. So all these things walk in the room for me so I'm not I see it as just um, a, a series of navigations we as a people need to network especially in Los Angeles network in a way where people know each other the art cloud house is a tribute to my my ancestors coming into Watts out of the southern migration from Houston right across the street from the Watts Towers we're absolutely rich uh, in culture in Watts with the best kept secret in LA. Watts Towers Art Center is 50 years old. We don't do mediocre because we don't have to. We have access to phenomenal artists. Is the term black artist supposed to be getting used to market you? Will that, will that get me further if I say black artist as opposed to art? We're here because there's people in charge and we're trying to get in. And the people in charge make the decisions. And sometimes we have to play a little ball for maybe one or two to get through. And then when that happens, then they can help out to open the door. Generally speaking, we try to think about doing shows that we think will be of interest to the audience, that the artists themselves deserve to have, that they, that they deserve to have this opportunity, uh, and that we think will make a difference in telling the larger story. For uh, the people whose birthplace is on this continent, your experience about how you tell your story and what it's about and what your history is, is very, very different. Wow. So you're the curator of this, huh? Yes, I am.
great job thank you this piece reunion is based on an actual life experience and it was a reunion that i had the family in baltimore maryland thank you mark you're welcome sure it's a good meeting it's a great meeting <laughs> <laughs> Just say who you are. Okay. Uh, hello, real quick. Uh, I am the new program manager of history at the California African American Museum, and I'm simultaneously a professor over at uh, the University of Southern California. That's the one across the street. <laughs> <laughs> And your name? Uh, that's, that's important, right? Sometimes. Uh, Javon Johnson is the name. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is an extraordinary Tony. Go ahead. Um, well, I know we, I don't know if the time frame is like, so long. Well, we, we have about an hour here, so. Well, um, th this is the embarkation canoe. So one of the ways they transported slaves from the, um, from land to the big ship was through a canoe. And so I lined the faces with the faces of authentic slaves. The bottom is lined with the children of slaves. I wanted particularly the people to know that you know, no one was exempt. Um, children were not exempt, uh, pregnant women. No one had any special uh, uh, exemption from this. So the crosses represent how, how religion was used as a form to justify slavery. And it was also used as a form of uh, our foundation uh, to push on. But this space right here will give you an example of what the shoulder space was allocated, which was 17 inches. So I invite each one of you to stand in here and, and just take a minute and just feel how, how small, how claustrophobic this is. I'm sure you've all read what the journey was like, um, how long the journey, how horrible it was, grass, peace, and death. This is the, uh, uh, the map of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it also includes 12 presidents who own slaves. So, you know, one of the things that we don't talk about enough, in, and I think in American history is not here, that how many presidents did actually, did actually own slaves. George Washington owning the most. So, 347 slaves. And I just wanted to bring that attention home so um, that, you know, that we are clear in all of the truth and history and, uh, and uh, are aware of, of this part of our past. The cotton beer in the cotton field. This is just uh, an example of what the, the end of the, the day would be like. And you broke in um, in pain. If I don't know if you know anyone that's picked cotton or heard people people come here and tell me how horrific it is, you know, with the, the thorns going up in your nails. And um, the requirement on the average was about 500 pounds of cotton, which I believe it is about 7,000 cotton balls. So just imagine that. Um, Thank you. Let me introduce Lily Bernard, who is a prominent artist in LA, uh, whose work is also absolutely stunning and magnificent. And she is on my list to write about, and that's coming very soon. Oh, I love you. I, lo I, love, I love these two people so much. I was born in Cuba, in Santiago de Cuba. And, um, City, I know. Yeah, and we were just talking about, um, if you don't know anything about your professor's history and how he testified against the KKK mm -hmm. when he was 14 years old. Amazing. Learn about it. And this woman is just a vessel of the ancestors. I love her so much. I'm so proud of her. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. This is her family. This is her ancestry. So you are so blessed. I asked my father, this is a gift, I said, Dad, you know, would you help me make this slave collar and the slave uh, um, chains over here um, as a birthday gift? I always ask for the stranger's gifts. So. But, you know, Dad um, had a, he said it was the most uh, difficult time in his life, was creating this. And one of those, uh, one of the many stories, and I don't have my glasses, I can't read it to you now, but my father wrote uh, in first person um, the story of his grandmother, Fine. And she was found in an abandoned um, shack. Her mother had died early, and she was taken in by white people. And she was treated cruelly. And my father celebrates Fine because she was sort of the matriarch that kept the family together when his mother was ill. She, even though she lived an oppressed life, I mean, inhumane and cruel, and he spells it out in, in, in the story, but she maintained a sense of love and pride and strength and, and uh, resistance, you know, and lifted the family up, even though she had experienced all those trials and tribulations. And I told my father I would keep her memory alive. 
and celebrate her. Um, one of the other uh, aspects of the installation is the, the slave cabin. When I learned of my family history, I went on a quest to understand more about American history. You know, why do you makes it so here? extraordinary is that this deals with the human dimension uh, of the experience of slavery and of ancestry. It's no longer a mere abstraction. When you see these pictures, you see that these are real human beings with hopes and aspirations, some of which were uh, hurt and destroyed because of the institution of slavery and racism. So when people come in and see this, they can identify with the actual human beings who are the subject of this. That's why art supplements history uh, in profound ways. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? Uh, just want to... I don't want to say anything. <laughs> you don't want to say anything? <laughs> no. I've been an artist for about 30 years, and I've done a lot of abstract work. I, I carve marble and totem poles and a lot of other things. But this episode, this part of the time in my career, is social consciousness. It's, it's, it's an awareness of we have a responsibility we go home? to educate, to lift, and to share, and the importance of that. And it's also part of the healing process. I think the, the more we have the dialogue about it, the more we uh, will also the story of the making of a slave, which is on this corner. Ah. Uh.